Hello everyone, my name is AJ Keith, and in this presentation I'll be covering this paper titled NPM1 Directs Pitosome Dependent Caspase 2 Activation in the Nucleolus. And it's published in the Journal of Cell Biology. I want to extend a special thanks to the authors for their uh, contribution to this field of research. Um, for this uh, presentation, I recommend that my viewers pause the video at each new slide and read through the material and analyze the graphics before playing my commentary. And if you have any questions, please comment them below and I will respond. And thank you for watching. The central research focus of this paper is on the, the mechanism of caspase II activation. Historically, there has been a lot of debate regarding how caspase II is activated because not only is caspase II activated by the conventional executional ca uh, caspases like caspase III, but it also appears to be uh, independently activated following DNA damage. So there are two primary routes of caspase II activation. You, you can see it happens during normal routine apoptosis because it's, it's cleaved alongside the typical caspase cascade following cytochrome C release. But caspase II is unique because it's the only caspase found in the nucleus during basal conditions. Although I should note that caspase three, which cleaves caspase two, is uh, shuttled to the nucleus um, to to cause cleavage of caspase two in the nucleus. So this is a, is an important consideration when interpreting these results. Uh, but regardless, experiments have tentatively suggested that caspase two can be activated following DNA damage independent of the status of mitochondria. So this is not 100% confirmed because caspase II is activated by many different stimuli. So it's hard to exactly pin down. And looking into this was, was part of the current paper's focus. So remember how APAF1 recruits caspase IX for proximity-induced dimerization and activation of inactive caspase IX monomers? Well, caspase II is activated in the same way, except its activation platform is not APAF1, but rather is the pitosome. The pitosome is the activation platform of caspase II, and it consists of two primary proteins, PID, P-I-D-D, and RAID, R-A-I-D-D. -D. PID is believed to be the primary uh, scaffolding protein, which we'll see in this paper why that is believed to be the case and RAID is the subunit of the pitosome that actually contains the CARD domain, the caspase recruitment domain that is specific for caspase II. And when, when RAID recruits two caspase II proteins, they are induced to dimerize and they activate. Um, there are also two characterized regulators of the pitosome. They are BUBR1 and CHK1. Uh, BUBR1 is a checkpoint control protein that is known to bind the region of, of RAID that normally binds PID, and thus it competitive, competitively prevents the formation of the pitosome by preventing the association of RAID and PID. CHK1 is, is more interesting because CHK1 is a negative regulator of the pitosome, despite being a kinase that is activated by damaged DNA. So, so CHK1 is activated by ATM, which itself is activated by DNA damage. And so this is, this is paradoxical because THK1 kinase activity is a proxy of DNA damage. It was found to inhibit the pitosome. Now, uh, molecular biology can be hopelessly complex at times, but I'm sure there's a method to its madness. But, but for the purposes of this paper, we don't have to dwell on this. The, the basic idea that, it, it, that we need to be cognizant of is that the formation of the pitosome is induced by DNA damage, it's negatively regulated by BUBR1 and CHK1, and its formation assembles a caspase II activation platform. So the, the pitosome-mediated activation of caspase II also appears to occur in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So just because caspase II appears to be activated by DNA damage in the nucleus doesn't mean that's the only mechanism that activates it. And it's also important to remember that caspase II activation is, is induced by dimerization at RAID. And we'll see why that's really important for, for this paper. The fundamental question fueling this research 
in this paper is, is kind of deceptively simple. The, the researchers simply wanted to know, does DNA damage really induce caspase II cleavage? And if it does, where does it happen and how does it happen? In other words, they simply wanted to characterize this supposed DNA damage pitosome caspase II pathway. And so this is what they found. First, DNA damage does induce caspase II activation by dimerization, and it occurs in both the nucleolus and the cytoplasm. Importantly, caspase II cleavage in the nucleus occurs in the absence of caspase III. So remember, caspase III cleaves caspase II, but in this paper, they show that caspase II is being activated before caspase III even reaches the nucleus. Thus, caspase III activation of nucleolar caspase II is, is highly unlikely. Instead, it appears that caspase II is being activated not by caspase III cleavage, but rather by proximity-induced dimerization and autocleavage at the pitosome. They then tested the effects of PID and RAID knockouts on the activation of caspase II, and they found that nucleolar caspase II activation requires PID and RAID. However, all caspase II activation in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus requires RAID. So in other words, cytoplasmic activation of caspase II uh, did not require PID, um, but nucleolar caspase II activation by dimerization, I should note, did require PID. So the researchers then did some uh, co-immunoprecipitations and they discovered this nucleolar protein called NPM1 to be interacting with PID during DNA damage, but not during basal conditions. Furthermore, they found this NPM1 PID interaction to be required for caspase II activation in the nucleolus. This led, to, this led them to speculate that NPM1 was directing or assisting in the interaction between PID and RAID to form the pitosome following DNA damage. They further looked into, into this NPM1 protein and they noticed that it had previously been characterized as a tumor suppressor. And they found that when NPM1 was deleted, it greatly desensitized cells to DNA damage induced apoptosis and promoted carcinogenesis. And this makes sense because NPM1 appears to be critical for the assembly of the pitosome following DNA damage, and thus the activation of caspase II. So without NPM1, and other DNA damage centers such as p53, cells can essentially ravage their DNA and have no induction of apoptosis. The first thing we need to uh, discuss is how they measured caspase II activation in vivo. So they used this, this very new and incredibly fascinating fluorescent venous protein in what is called a bimolecular fluorescence complementation assay, or BIFC. BIFC. This entails splitting the venous fluorophore into two fragments and then fusing them onto caspase II proteins. And then when caspase II is coerced to dimerize at the pitosome, it will also induce the dimerization of the split venous protein attached to caspase II. And when venous recombines by this method, it will regain its fluorescence that can be measured. So the basic idea is that wherever you see uh, yellow fluorescence, such as in these images, um, it means that caspase II was activated there by proximity-induced dimerization. So the mechanism of caspase II activation by cleavage, for example, would not produce this yellow fluorescence. This yellow fluorescence is thus evidence of dimerization-induced activation of caspase II, and thus a, a special, acti a special uh, pathway of caspase II activation. So this system had previously been characterized and validated by another research group, and they also confirmed it was working as intended in this paper by using positive controls, uh, Taxol and, and uh, Vincristine. Both drugs are known to activate caspase II, and, and indeed it, it produced robust BIFC signal. In contrast, they use a negative control called uh, actinomycin D, which is known to cause apoptosis independent of caspase II. And so, uh, actinomycin D failed to produce any kind of significant BIFC fluorescence. Although it did produce a little, which is slightly disconcerting, but regardless, they used various uh, genotoxic agents that induce DNA damage, and they observed these punctate-like staining of BIFC, indicating that DNA damage was inducing the activation of caspase II. 
Interestingly, the, the punctate staining of BIFC following DNA damage was occurring primarily in the nucleolus because it was co-localized with the nucleolar protein uh, fibrillarin, fibrillarin. You can see the nucleolus is in these these areas right here. And you see these, the robust staining of um, caspate or a, a BIFC signal is occurring in the nu nucleolus following treatment with camptothecin, which is a genotoxic agent. So geno, uh, uh, camptothecin induced the most clear nucleolar confined BIFC staining. And so for much of the subsequent experiments, they actually used uh, camptothecin to study the nucleolar activation of caspase II. So in the top right example, you, you see it, it, it produces really robust um, punctate staining in the nucleolus. So next, the researchers did a Western blot of fractionated cells for caspase II. Uh, fibrillarin was used to indicate the nucleolar compartments and GAP-DH, uh, GAP-DH down here, was used to indicate the, the cytoplasmic and nuclear fractions. So GAP-DH is highly abundant in the, in the cytoplasm, moderately abundant in the nucleus, and absent in the nucleolus. And uh, fibrillarin was present in the nucleolus. So this is how they know uh, what compartment they're actually observing. So you can see the, um, so we have this cytoplasmic nuclear and nucleolar fraction. They then stained for caspase II by C2. We, we see three bands in the caspase II stains, the, the C2FL or caspase II full length uncleaved. And then we see the P35 and the P20, um, which indicate cleaved activated caspase II fragments. Because remember, caspase II dimerization induces autocleavage of an inhibitory prodomain that activates the caspase. And so you can see that camptothecin treatment induced cleavage of caspase II in the cytoplasm and the nucleolus, but not so much in the nucleus. So we see these cleaved fragments in the nucleolus and somewhat in the, or abundantly in the cytoplasm, but not so much in the nucleus. They did another Western blot, not shown here, that, that did not see caspase three in the nucleus or the nucleolus. So that's not included in, the, in, in, in these images, but just remember that they did a Western blot looking at caspase two, and they did not see it in the, um, in the nucleus or the, or the nucleolus at this time point. And, and, um, and that, but my, that also might explain why there's so much cleaved uh, caspase two in the cytoplasm is because caspase three is found there. And so a lot of this cleaved caspase two in the cytoplasm is probably is probably due to um, caspase three cleavage. And the reason we don't see more robust BIFC staining in the cytoplasm as we did up here, because look at the, there's cleaved caspase two in the cytoplasm, right? So why don't we see BIFC staining in the cytoplasm? And, and this is because remember, BIFC only detects caspase two at dimerization at card domains. So all this cleave caspase two in the cytoplasm is probably actually mostly from non-dimerized induced caspase activation, such as caspase three cleavage. And BIFC is, is, is specific for the activation at card domains. So not the activation by cleavage. So what we have so far at this point is that DNA damage agents induce caspase II dimerization in the nucleolus. Now you can see a summary of these images in, in this graph down here. The yellow indicates the nucleolar activation of caspase II by uh, dimerization. And you see the majority of the BIFC staining in uh, camptothecin is, is occurring in the nucleolus. And very, very, very small amount is occurring in the nucleus. And you see a similar pattern with uh, these other two um, genotoxic agents, but generally, uh, when, when you're using campothecin, which is what they use from here on, is that the nucleolar activation of caspase two is, is, is induced by campothecin. So to characterize how caspase two is being activated, the researchers generated these PID and RAID knockout cells using the CRISPR-Cas9 setup. So we know that the caspase II activation platform is the pitosome. So just how important are PID and RAID 
for the cytosolic and the nucleolar activation of caspase 2. So let's begin with PID knockout. So we're beginning right in through here. Uh, what, you, what happens when PID is knocked out is, is we, see, we, we see that the nucleolar activation of caspase 2 is almost completely absent when, when PID is deleted. But the cytosolic and the nucleolar caspase 2 activation is still practically normal. So you see, you see the yellow fraction, which represents the um, nucleolar activation of, of caspase 2, uh, almost completely disappears when PID is knocked out. This is the double negative knockout of PID, and there's no nucleolar activation when PID is knocked out. And these figures are going to be generated by, um, by the careful analysis of images such as these ones over here. So you see in the, the confocal images of, of PID that the knockouts still show some BIFC staining, but it almost it pretty much never occurs in the nucleolus. So what they're doing is they're going through and they're counting where these BIFC stainings are occurring, and they're not seeing any occurrence of BIFC staining in the nucleolus when PID is removed. So the, the first row I should I should note is we're looking at BIFC staining in the first row. And the second row is M cherry, just which is just used to label cells. And the third row is BIFC and M cherry merged. And the last row is a is a zoomed in uh, image of the, the BIFC staining. So so just to clarify, knocking out PID prevented nucleolar activation of caspase 2, but not nuclear or cytoplasmic activation. So the pathway that leads to nucleolar caspase 2 activation must require PID. RAID, on the other hand, which contained the card domain specific for caspase 2, is universally required for caspase 2 proximity-induced activation. The RAID knockouts lack almost all BIFC activity. You see when RAID is knocked out right here, we see almost no... We, this is basically the static background of BIFC staining. So there's, there's no proximity-induced caspase 2 activation occurring. And, and the images, you can also see this. When, when RAID is knocked out, you, we, there's nothing in these images. So RAID is required for all caspase 2 proximity-induced activation, while PID is, uh, seems to be only required for the nucleolar activation of caspase 2. OK, now that we know uh, DNA damage induces robust nucleolar caspase 2 dimerization and activation that is dependent on PID and RAID. So now that we know that, we would like to know more about this pathway, right? Since, since PID is uniquely required for nucleolar activation, they decided to do some immunoprecipitations of PID and see what proteins are associated with it. So they decided to start by looking at NPM1. And I'm not entirely sure how they landed on NPM1. Um, they, the paper says they decided to look at possible interactions between NPM1 and PID because they were co-localized in the nucleolus and because NPM1 is a known tumor suppressor and is known to be localized to the nucleolus. And so it may be contributing to caspase 2 activation. Regardless of how they decide to look at NPM1, they found that immunoprecipitating PID, so they're immunoprecipitating PID, and then, then they subsequently are staining for NPM1. And NPM1 was only detected in cells treated with CPT, campothecin. So in other words, PID and NPM1 were only interacting in cells uh, with DNA damage induced by campothecin, but not in untreated cells. So ACT D is the is the negative control, which induces out apoptosis independent of caspase two, and it did not show any interaction with NPM1. So just to reemphasize, they're pulling down PID, and then they're staining on a Western blot for NPM1, and you, they're seeing the same amount of PID expression. PID is staining at the same amount, but the NPM1 is only being pulled down when there's DNA damage induced by CPT. And then they did the reverse experiment. So instead of pulling down PID, they, they, they are pulling down NPM1 and then staining for PID. And they observed, they observed the, the same pattern. Immunoprecipitation of NPM1 only pulled down PID in cells treated with CPT. So again, pulling down NPM1, then staining in a Western blot for PID, they see it only 
PID MPM1 interaction in the CPT condition. And there's uh, relatively uh, conserved amounts of MPM1. So they did a bunch of other co-IPs uh, that are not included in this presentation, but they were basically looking at different regions of PID and MPM1, and they determined that the LRR domain of PID was binding to NPM1 because it re was required for the, the pulling down or the interaction as confirmed by a, a co-IP. So I don't think it's too important for the purposes of this presentation, but if you are interested in the specific domain interactions between PID and NPM1, they did look at that in, in this paper. So I would, if you're interested, check it out. Uh, nevertheless, it is clear that NPM1 and PID interact following DNA damage. That is the basic idea of this slide. The next question is, does the PID NPM1 interaction following DNA damage have any mechanistic value? Is this interaction meaningful for the caspase 2 activation pathway? They did two sets of experiments, both using different cells. So in this Western blot, they used uh, P53 NPM1 double knockout cells to determine if caspase 2 was being cleaved. So you can see in across all of these cells, they're using P53 knockout uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts. So they wanted to knock out P53 because they knew that P53 is a major DNA damage sensor and is basically an alternative DNA damage pathway. And their reasoning was that if they wanted to tease out the individual effects of NPM1 on caspase 2 activation following DNA damage, they would need to get rid of P53. Otherwise, it would be possible that widespread apoptosis caused by P53 sensing DNA damage was inducing caspase 2 cleavage through some other means such as caspase 3 activation. So in other words, if P53 was present, any caspase 2 cleavage could simply be collateral damage from other caspases like caspase 3. So they knocked out P53, and in these P53 deleted cells, they still observed robust caspase 2 cleavage following uh, camptothecin treatment uh, in these lanes right through here. So you see when NPM1 is present, they still observe uh, cleavage of caspase 2 because you see this uh, these cleavage fragments. So when, sorry, NPM1 is still here, indicated by these bands, and we see that in, um, caspase 2 is being cleaved. And so, so in these cells, the idea is that DNA damage is activating caspase 2 cleavage through NPM1, PID, and RAID. However, when NPM1 is deleted in these lanes, uh, you lose almost all caspase 2 cleavage. So the, I mean, that's really amazing, right? The only difference between these lanes right through here and these lanes is the presence of PID. So even if you ignore the potential confounding variables from deleting P53, that might get some people stuck up. Uh, the only difference between these lanes and these lanes is NPM1. And the the loss of NPM1 almost completely eliminated caspase 2 cleavage. So this suggests that NPM1 is driving the cleavage of caspase 2, very likely through its interaction with PID, which is also required for nuclear caspase 2 cleavage. And, it, and this was discovered without any changes in, in PIDosome in caspase 2 expression, which they tested in another Western blot. So the authors did a second set of experiments uh, that instead of knocking out NPM1, they knocked down NPM1 using SI RNA down here. SI NPM1. So this is RNA interference. And instead of measuring caspase 2 cleavage product like they were in, over here, they are measuring uh, the using the BIFC assay. So they're measuring caspase 2 dimerization, which is distinctly different from caspase 2 cleavage. And what they observed was that when NPM1 RNA was inhibited, they, there was a large reduction in the nucleolar caspase 2 dimerization activation platform, uh, activity. So the cytosolic activation of um, 
uh, of caspase 2, the dimerization of caspase 2 was still occurring normally when, or sorry, uh, over here, when the siRNA for MPM1 was administered, you still see robust BIFC activation, but very little of it is actually in the nucleus or the nucle nucleolus right here. However, when the siRNA was switched for a control siRNA, just a random one, there's robust nucleolar activation of the BIFC, the caspase 2. So, so all the pieces are basically coming together now. So DNA damage induces nucleolar caspase 2 dimerization and activation. This dimerization requires PID and RAID, and it occurs in the absence of caspase 3. Uh, PID interacts with MPM1, and MPM1 was subsequently found to also be required for nucleolar caspase 2 dimerization and cleavage. So, so what do we make of all this? Well, DNA damage induced processing of caspase 2 by the pidosome requires MPM1, PID, and RAID. Uh, cytosolic dimerization and activation of caspase 2 only requires RAID, but still accounts for about 40% of the DNA damage induced activation of caspase 2, as you can see from here. Still require, it still accounts for a lot of it, but the nucleolar activation of caspase 2 is largely dependent on NPM1 because you can see when NPM1 is knocked down using siRNA, you almost get no um, active nucleolar activation of caspase 2. And you see a similar pattern over here. So we're not quite done. Now that the pathway is better understood, it can be tested. Because if it's true that caspase 2 activation following DNA damage depends on MPM1, then we should be able to test that theory in models of cancer. And that is what the authors did. So they did a couple of different experiments. For example, they found that tunnel positive cells, a marker of apoptosis, um, were, was vastly reduced in cells missing NPM1. So these cells uh, missing both uh, P53 and NPM1 were nearly incapable of inducing apoptosis following DNA damage. So NPM1 serves as an alternative mechanism to P53 of inducing apoptosis following DNA damage. In the figure to the left, cells missing P53 and NPM1, but not P53 alone, were practically oblivious to to the genotoxic agents because they couldn't activate the P53 pathway and they also couldn't activate the caspase 2 pathway because NPM1 was gone. You can see that the, the NPM1 minus minus and the TP53 knockout, when both these are knocked out, you, you get almost no apoptosis following um, irradiation, which is IR. When you irradiate these cells, you're destroying the DNA and there's still no apoptosis because uh, NPM1 and P53 is knocked out. If you just have P53, or sorry, if you just have NPM1, but you no know P53, you, you still get a pretty high amount of apoptosis in, in this, in the irradi irradiation. And the this is um, an, an inhibitor. The GO is an inhibitor of CHK1 that presumably activates caspase 2 cleavage. But uh, regardless, we see that when NPM1 and P TP53 are knocked out, there's no, um, or very little uh, activation of, of, of apoptosis. And in another assay of apoptosis, the Annexin-5 assay that detects uh, flipped phosphatidylserine also showed that apoptosis was markedly reduced in the NPM1 P53 dual knockouts, but not so much in the, in the um, uh, P53 knockouts that retained uh, NPM1. So if NPM1 is still present, the cells are much better suited at entering apoptosis following uh, DNA damage. And so this collectively suggests that NPM1 is critical to the induction of apoptosis following DNA damage, presumably by assisting in the nucleolar construction of the pitosome. 
So after all is said and done, like most research papers, you should be left with more questions than answers. So here are a couple of, of my questions. So if caspase 2, the pitosome, and MPM1 induce, induces apoptosis following DNA damage, then does the loss of any of these proteins lead to genetic instability in cancer? So that answer seems to be yes. Um, they, they addressed this question. They said studies have shown that caspase 2 is a tumor suppressor in knocking out caspase 2 promotes the proliferation and uh, of cancer cells and their genetic instability. But we still have MPM1 and PID. Um, and I'm curious what contributions do these players have in, in carcinogenesis? For example, if PID is uniquely required for nucleolar caspase 2 activation in response to DNA damage, then what effect will knocking out PID have? And this seems to be kind of a central question. We know that caspase 2 is activated in both the cytoplasm and the nucleolus, but to tease out the individual contribution of each to something like cancer or apoptosis, then knocking out PID would be a good start, right? Because according to this paper, according to this paper, they, they are claiming that PID is only required for nucleolar activation of caspase 2. So knocking out PID should be equivalent to inhibiting only the nucleolar caspase 2 activation. So by knocking out PID, you're essentially asking what happens when nucleolar caspase 2 activation is blocked, but not cytoplasmic activation of, of caspase 2. And that might help you tease out the uh, individual effects. So another big question you might have is what are the nucleolar or nuclear substrates of activated caspase 2? Does nucleolar activated caspase 2 hold any particular significance? And this is related to the first question, like, I mean, should we even care about whether caspase 2 is activated in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? The answer according to this paper is, is probably, because remember, MPM1 is needed for nucleolar activation of caspase 2, not cytoplasmic, and was a strong inducer of apoptosis in cells lacking P53. So what exactly is activated caspase 2 cleaving in the nucleus to induce apoptosis that is distinct from what it's doing in the cytoplasm? Another question I had was, how does, uh, how does DNA damage cause activation of caspase 2 in the cytoplasm? So we know nucleolar activation of caspase 2 following DNA damage occurs through MPM1 and PID, but this only accounts for about half of the activated caspase 2 proteins. Because following DNA damage, half of all the activated caspase 2 proteins occurs in the cytoplasm and is independent of NPM1 and PID. Another question you might have overlooked is how does DNA damage turn into activated caspase 2? We know the key players are PID, RAID, and NPM1, but we actually don't know how DNA damage activates them to form the pitosome. So what signaling events are occurring between DNA damage and the pitosome formation? So I hope you enjoyed this paper. If you have any questions yourself, please post them. I would love to talk about it. And again, I wanna thank the authors for this great paper. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading it and presenting on it. And I, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.